There is, there's the gamut of emotions, there's the gamut of experiences, and we could say that there is a certain addiction to all of it. But I would say that if there is a correlation between having some sense of association with more of the negative feelings, it's just the justification of one's perspective. That's all it is, right? So if somebody is drawn to enjoying, we could say, those darker emotions, all I hear in that is that they get to be right about their own view of themselves. It's, it's so basic when you look at it, but the ego's primary goal is just to be right about its own perspective. Yeah. So this is where, you know, when people will say things like, I knew that would happen, or that always happens to me. That's no longer like an objective analysis of the unfolding of life. That's a subjective narrative that is constantly reinforcing its own perspective. That's all it is. Being right is the poor man's version of self-worth. It's like recognizing, wow, I'm, I might not get what I want, but I'm right about it, which is why most relationships don't work. Because people aren't in a relationship with the other person. They're in a relationship with their own idea of themselves, and it's a self-preserving mechanism. So as long as you behave in the way that I like you to behave, then we get along fine. If you don't, then this relationship is on the rocks. And yet you are in this isolation chamber where you, you are resisting what is actually trying to be born here, which is forgiveness and apology, you know, your humanity. It's okay. But can you make space for the part of you that gets hurt? Can you make space for the part of you that gets scared? It's okay. So that primordial urge to be right, to survive, is ironically, that is the death of possibility. And so that really is just this ongoing opportunity. If you're willing to reconcile and mitigate all of these beliefs of who you are to step into a different iteration of yourself that is more expanded. Mm. That's a, that, to me, is a life worth living. People go through life as prisoners of their mind. The only prison, the only prison anyone lives in is their own perspective, their own point of view. And if you can crack that, there is no greater gift. There's no greater sense of liberation and freedom than to be able to help somebody see the prison they live within that they superimpose onto circumstance, but really as a reflection of the conversation they've had inside of them usually for decades. And to break that apart, that's recoding that really is the ultimate emancipation of suffering. So the more that I can step into that space of uncertainty continually is the degree to which I'm in a place of expansion. And then life is just unfolding. It's got to do with my response to it. How do I dance with that? How do I relate to that? Which is the revelatory nature of life. It's just to what degree do all of those transactions reveal something about your own sense of fear and inadequacy? That's the lie. So if who I am in the way that I relate to myself is feeling that essence of insecurity, then by design, a behavioral adaptation, something that I pursue, has got to be some security. And we find security in all sorts of ways, right? Predominantly through finance, through some relativity to a person, like if we have a partner, if we have a company, we find some sense of security. But it's, it's transitory, it's illusory, and ultimately it will dissipate. So real security, true security, is when I can sit in the absence of needing security. That's the real secure essence of who I am in the absence of anything that would pertain to human security because that is always going to be, you know, at best transitory. So that is real expansion is when I, when I become associated with my true nature, it's no longer dependent on anything that is outside of me. That's that is for me the quintessential expression of success mm -hmm. is i'm at peace regardless of circumstance i am not at the effect of circumstance i am cause in the way that i experience myself in life regardless of what's happening around me what people are doing is they're desperately trying to control circumstances under the impression that if i get everything perfect in the way i want it then I will finally be at peace. And this is why we have this one day illusion, right? Like my, this isn't my life right now, but wait, you know, I'm getting there, which then creates this psychological time. Everything that we think we want is out there somewhere, right? In the future. Where does that come from? What was, what was I actually in, interpreting that event or those words to mean about my own preservation? Because it's always a perceived threat. That's all it is. It's a perceived threat. To what? to your identity that is desperately trying to hold on to whatever it thinks is right. Somebody who's very, very tight psychologically, it doesn't take much to piss them off because they don't have any threshold, 
right? And that's why one of my questions is, can I be with this? Is an expression I use for myself. What is happening? What did they say? What news did I get? Can I be with this? What does that mean? Can I stay centered and at peace regardless? Now, I'm still human. I'm still a work in progress. There might be certain things that trigger, but to me, I don't see it as something to be defensive about. I see it as an opportunity for more awareness. Oh, wow. Why Why was that something that I got a little bit triggered by? That's the opportunity. And it's a different reframe. Instead of trying to control that, make them wrong, tell them to go fuck themselves or whatever it is that we do when we feel threatened. It's like, okay, why in the the infinite power of my true essence do I feel so scared in this situation? Because that's not... That's a lie. Thinking that I'm not okay with what happened or I'm not going to be okay, meaning it's a threat to my existence, that's a lie. So there's the opportunity is, okay, thank you, life, for revealing somewhere within me that I'm still holding on to something that is self-preserving in nature, which does not serve me. If I don't understand that beyond the, the narrative of inadequacy, beyond the dialogue of scarcity lies the abundance of everything, then I'm always associated with those feelings of limitation for which reason I am going to generate expectation. So for me, it's not about trying to deal with expectation. I'm dissolving the idea that there's anything missing in the first place. Now it becomes a process of creation versus reaction. It becomes a process of exploration versus searching. I'm not missing anything. Whereas in adults, we develop over time this idea of scarcity, inadequacy, and security. And now it's a compensation game. How can I compensate for that which I am perpetually believing in, which itself is illusory? That's why it's exhausting, because you're lying to yourself. And now I'm just trying to compensate. It's an adaptation, right? So that's the difference is I don't live in the world of expectation. I live in the world of uncertainty, which is itself mystical. It's magical. It's surprising. I don't need to know what's going to happen because there's nothing missing in the first place. Now, I could have personal preference. Sometimes I'd like things to go a certain way and sometimes I'd like them not to go a certain way. Where's their expectation? Expectation is a psychological ex extension of something that I feel from an ego's perspective is what I want or don't want. It's shame or pride. It's all the facets of the ego looking to protect or to garner. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. And in the absence of all of that, there's just life unfolding. I watched my uncle die of uh, lymphoma. It imprinted in me uh, an innate fear of that reality. What I hear more than anything is that it's less about your concern for the fear of death. What I really still am present to is the little boy who loves and misses his uncle. 
That's what I really hear. Like that's where you're stuck in time. It's less about your future and it's the fact that you lost in your mind somebody who meant so much to you. And that's where the hurt actually is. Yeah. He yeah. meant so much to you. And in a way, he was almost immortal in your eyes. And so there's a bit of an aberration in the way that you see this big man. It's like, how could that happen? And as a little boy, how could you ever be as big as him? And so if it can happen to him, then for sure, somebody who's as mortal as you can never match his grandiose presence for you, right? But see, that's what's beautiful for me is less concern about your future and more just really embodying the love. Like, you know, what's really beautiful is how big your heart is. But don't shackle it. Like, feel it. Mm -hmm. Feel it. Express how much that man. Tell stories about him. Don't use his death as an excuse to worry about your own. Use mm -hmm. his death as the opportunity to see how loving you are. Yeah. How much you care. And that to me is the precursor to then living a life that has got way more significance than a little guy who's scared of dying of cancer. That's so beneath you. Right. I get it, you're human. But if he can be a role model for you in the way that he is a catalyst to inspire the release of how much love you have, don't be stingy with that love. If you have one more day on this planet or you have 60 as I proposed, don't hold back love just because you're scared. 